everyone. Um, thank you very much, Eileen, for, for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to talk in the next uh, 24 minutes, 25 minutes, for the, our results on the deep models under the GAM paper, uh, joint work with Professor Ateniese and Professor Perez Cruz. So uh, just to give you like a hint on what do we do here, we investigate whether the decentralized or as known collaborative or federated deep learning approach is more um, privacy preserving than the centralized one. So um, since today it's Halloween, and uh, in order to make the things a little bit more spooky or scary, uh, I'm going to talk also about uh, a new active inference attack on uh, collaborative deep learning, where we utilize the generative adversarial networks, differently known as, uh, as GANs. I'm, I'm going to provide details on how the GANs work later during the talk. Okay, um, so a little bit about uh, deep learning. So a little bit like deep learning 101. So uh, deep learning is a branch of machine learning that essentially makes use of a neural networks. So a concept that dates back like 50, 60 years ago. And uh, they are capable to find solutions for a variety of um, complex tasks, either in a supervised and unsupervised way. So um, as you guys most probably know, deep learning has seen uh, tremendous success in various areas of uh, computer science, including here, but um, not limited to, of course, computer vision, um, image processing, face recognition, text-to-speech systems, uh, natural language processing, games, and, of course, in, even in the security and privacy domain. In the slides over here, I've presented uh, some uh, results that uh, can be considered as major successes of, uh, of deep learning. Uh, one of them is uh, AlphaGo. I'm sure everyone over here has heard about it. So it's uh, baby, uh, basically the, the baby uh, of uh, DeepMind, which was able to uh, understand and comprehend how the game of Go works and defeat uh, the champion in this game, uh, Lisa Dodd. Uh, in, the, in the corner of the slide, you can see a face recognition system, which basically relies on, on neural networks. And interestingly, uh, maybe you have heard of it, uh, there is this bot on Twitter uh, named DeepDrump, which is essentially trained on, it's a neural network based uh, bot trained on uh, President Trump's tweets, and then the bot uh, essentially tries to, to produce tweets that look like the one uh, produced by, by the president. Of course, uh, I, I have to point out over here that uh, the, it, this doesn't mean that the natural language processing has been solved as a problem, but the tweets look like realistic enough uh, for, for the case. Now, uh, deep learning is cool, right? But essentially, it can be pulled down to two major components. So deep learning, basically, in order for someone to, to use this, this uh, amazing technology, needs to have like huge quantities of data, and at the same time, needs to have a huge computational power. So, if you have these two together, essentially you, you can uh, apply uh, deep neural networks to any task that, that you can have. Now, the thing is that, um, prior to going to, to this slide, is that since it requires large quantities of data, this might make deep learning impractical uh, for persons or entities who have, uh, let's say, rim limited resources or small quantities of, of training data. Okay, uh, so prior to going to the decentralized or collaborative learning, I'm going to explain a little bit the centralized learning scheme. Now, in such kind of a scenario, we have uh, each and every one of the users pulls their, their local training data, their data sets, to a large, to a huge data set, right? So they are pulled to a center, to, to a server, to the cloud, to an entity, and then it is this service provider which trains the model and uh, on all of this training data and allows the, the participants to essentially query the model and uh, get, uh, get answers. Uh, the thing over here on the centralized learning scheme is that the participants, each and every one of us providing the data, have no control over the learning process. So we are not able to control what the model uh, on, the, on the service provider is going to learn or what else can, uh, can be done on our data. And we cannot be sure whether our data was um, completely removed from the server and so on and so forth. So, um, of course, uh, as you can easily notice, this might make um, deep learning in such kind of scenario not really attractive for entities who, who are using or who uh, are in possession of, um, of sensitive data, such as medical institutions 
or governmental agencies, which cannot easily pull their information into, into large data sets. So in such kind of a scenario, the adversary, as can be thought, lies only on the central authority, so only on the entity providing the, the service. So they are the ones controlling the learning process, and they are the ones that control what, um, what can be done with, uh, with the data. So uh, the question that normally can arise from such kind of a scenario is that whether it is possible to learn while preserving the privacy. And the answer to this question uh, is yes. It was actually given at, uh, at CCS 2015, so like two years ago, with uh, the introduction of the collaborative learning or a decentralized uh, learning scheme. It's worth noting here that uh, like a collaborative learning approach has existed even before as a, as a concept or as an idea in the machine learning community. However, it was at uh, CCS uh, that privacy was taken into consideration. In such kind of a scenario, in a decentralized learning scheme, each and every one of the participants keeps their training data local. At the same time, each and every one of the participants has a replica of the model that they are willing to train, as, as you can see also um, in the figure. And what they are doing is that they, they train on their local data and they only share uh, batches of parameters um, by the means of a parameter server with one another. So. Um, of course, this is not only like uh, an academic uh, research. Recently, Google has shown that uh, with their federated learning approach that they are attempting to make this uh, a reality. And actually, they are um, testing this one in the, in the Gboard. So the federated learning approach is being uh, tested on Gboard. Uh, so the thing here with the decentralized learning scheme is that the participants in such kind of scenario are able, are capable to indirectly influence the learning of one another. So by sharing these parameters with one another, it means that at some point, after many, many iterations, you will have a model that has learned on over, uh, over all this, uh, this uh, training data. Of course, without revealing the actual training data to, to one another. Furthermore, the researchers um, uh, provided differential privacy as a mean to further uh, minimize the leakages by this parameter sharing uh, that are done on the on the parameter server. However, uh, in such kind of a scenario, the the authors uh, only considered a passive adversary. So essentially, the users were honest to one another. However, uh, they were curious in the end, so they might attempt to learn something from from uh, from the model. So uh, some attacks on machine learning models that prior to, prior to our work. Of course, I'm listing here only three, but there are many, many more. However, these are a little bit more relevant to, to what we are doing. So as was said even in the morning, given access to, to the model, so you can learn a lot from it. And as it was the case uh, with the hacking smart machines with smarter uh, ones, so in this paper, the, the authors essentially are able to train meta classifiers using the, the actual train model, and these meta classifiers uh, were capable to infer um, information on the training data, such as the ethnicity or the gender of the, of the participants. Furthermore, again at CCS 2015, with the model inversion attack, so the adversary given a black box access to the model and knowing a label was able to reconstruct images of, of the participants of the training data. And with the membership inference attack in SMP uh, 2017, so the authors over here want to verify whether a record was used or not to, to train a particular model. Now, um, the thing here is that going, from, going bottom up in the membership inference attack, so uh, the adversary has a record and he wants to verify whether it was not part of the training process or not. Now, this is not the case in the decentralized learning approach because each and every one of the participants keeps their training data uh, private. In the model inversion attacks and uh, consecutively the, the Hagen Smart Machines one, so uh, we, tempt, uh, we applied the model inversion attack to, to the trained model in a, in a collaborative learning way. However, uh, we noticed then when the architecture of the model was uh, complex, so we had to deal with more complex architectures such as convolutional neural networks, the reconstructions were not as good as, um, as expected. And this concurs with the results from the mistaken shown in the membership inference attacks. Okay, 
So now going to, to the fun part, so to, to our work. On the decentralized learning scheme, as I said, each and every one of the participants has the possibility to uh, influence the learning of the other ones. What this means is that uh, potentially each and every one of these participants can be an adversary in such kind of a learning scenario. Why is that? Because now each and every one of them has a replica of the model and essentially this shifts the, the adversary from the, from the server or from the entity that was before providing uh, the, the deep learning, let's say, to each and every one of the participants. So the case here is that each and every one of these guys participating in the learning can uh, influence the learning of the others in such a way, so sharing these uh, crafty parameters in such a way that the victims uh, or the, the ones that they are targeting will leak more information than intended. And after noticing this, we, said, uh, we thought that, okay, um, can, we, uh, can we use neural networks essentially to, to attack uh, neural networks? And our answer to this question was yes, so we utilize uh, the generative adversarial networks. So uh, what are generative adversarial networks? So they are a pretty recent concept in, uh, in machine learning communities. So they were uh, introduced in 2014 by um, a good fellow and his team, and they have seen many, many developments in the, in the recent years. So they have been even considered like one of the best um, developments in the machine learning community in the last um, 10 years by uh, Lecun. So how does a GAN work? So uh, the GAN architecture is composed of, two, you have two models, so you have a discriminator and a generator. And these models essentially play a, a game with one another. So the generator, in this case, is trying to, to convince the discriminator that the, di the data that it is providing is, is real, okay? And on the other hand, the discriminator has to become good enough to distinguish between the real and fake samples. So doing this one uh, in many, many iterations, in the end, uh, the generator will be good enough to produce samples that come, that are look-alike of the underlying distribution of, of the um, training data. So the way we see this one, we see it as the, uh, an eyewitness and uh, that has essentially witnessed a, a criminal or has seen a crime and the police sketch artist. So the thing here is that the police sketch artist starts drawing a sketch of the potential criminal, and based on the answer coming from the eyewitness, it modifies the sketch in such a way that in the end, it will potentially uh, look like the, the criminal. Okay. So some results uh, in the literature. I've extracted these ones from uh, several machine learning papers. So all of the results that you see in this slide come from uh, our uh, GAN generated, so you see the handwritten uh, images of the MNIS data set, or you, uh, over there you have also CIFAR-10 images, so, uh, which is even more complex uh, in nature, and it's composed of various classes like horses, um, uh, ships, cars, and so on and so forth. GANs were able to uh, generate faces, album covers, bedrooms, and they are improving a lot daily. Like uh, a couple of days back, there was a paper from researchers from NVIDIA which have improved the learning process of a gun furthermore by producing even higher resolution um, results. And we have seen also results of uh, GANs trained on text generation. Okay, uh, so how does our attack work? Consider the following scenario where we have um, two users that essentially are trying to collaboratively train a model with one another. On the left hand side you can see uh, there is the honest user which essentially has two classes, um, Alice and Bob. And on the uh, right-hand side of the, of the slide, you can see the, the adversary, which has essentially uh, images corresponding to the Bob class, and he also introduces an Eve class. So over here, you can see Eve class as an analogy to the fake samples in the actual uh, GAN architecture. Now, since Bob class is in common, uh, naturally the, the adversary would like to know what Alice class look like or the records over there look like. So uh, in order to perform this collaborative learning approach, they, um, both of the users agree on the common learning objective, on the architecture of the model, and consecutively they also know um, the labels. So in, in such a scenario, we are going to train uh, a multi-class classifier consisting of um, three classes, Alice, Bob, and, um, and Eve. 
So let's uh, split this process into, into chunks. So when it is victim's turn, the victim will train uh, the local model on its own personal data. So in this case, on Alice and Bob's uh, records that it has on the local training data. Furthermore, as agreed on the protocol, <coughs> they will select a, a portion of these parameters, of these newly trained and updated parameters, to share on the, on the parameter server. And this essentially finalizes one turn of training from the honest user. Now, when it is the adversary's turn, he will uh, download a portion of the parameters, again, according to the protocol, from, uh, from the parameter server. It is worth pointing out over here that uh, they, they can uh, essentially download a percentage of these parameters uh, or, or all of them. And the adversary updates the local model. So what does this mean? In this case, the local model of the adversary has learned something new on the local training data of the victim, of the target. So what happens now? Now, this model becomes a discriminator, right? This classifier becomes a discriminator. And the adversary essentially attaches a generator model to this discriminator. So the generator now will start querying this model for the target class, for the class of interest. So it, it will produce something, uh, an, something an, an image, and it will query the discriminator. Is this essentially an image of Alice, okay? And the discriminator will say yes or no. Of course, in the beginning, the discriminator is really robust in this one because the results provided by the generator are, are not good enough. However, um, in time, the generator will, generators produce samples which come closer and closer to the actual uh, victim's training data distribution that uh, they will confuse the discriminator even more so the discriminator will need more information to essentially draw the boundary between the Alice and Eve uh, uh, produced samples. So the generators produce samples. Okay, uh, as soon as, so essentially, as I said, this affects both the generator and the discriminator. So also the parameters of the, uh, the discriminator uh, will, will be affected in, in this scenario. So the adversary afterwards will carry the protocol as intended. So select a portion of the parameters and upload these parameters into the parameter server. So uh, as I said, uh, those parameters, uh, sorry, I, for I forgot to point it out, those uh, could be also obfuscated by, by differential privacy. So some noise could be added to them prior to uploading them in the, in the parameter server. So over here, we are showing initially some, some of our results in the experiments without the differential privacy. So we did experiments on uh, two data sets. The MNIST dataset, which is like the most obvious one, and a phase dataset. And as you can see in the first, rec uh, first row, there are the actual images. And in the second row, there are the generated data. And you can easily see that the original and generated data are quite close to one another. Looking close enough, you can see that, okay, there are distortion over there, but you can easily tell that the, vic uh, the victim or the class of interest had, had glasses, for instance. Um, we, we, did f we basically extended our experiments into adding more participants to see and how this would affect the, the process. So over here, and, and most importantly, we gave no training data at all to, to the adversary. So what the adversary was just targeting one of the victim's um, classes. And again, uh, we were successful into reconstructing uh, samples uh, using, using the generative adversarial uh, networks in both the differential privacy, when differential privacy was adopted and it was, when it was not. And these are some of our results when differential privacy is, is used in, in such kind of scenarios. So again, at the generated sample in the face, uh, face example over there, you can still see that the guy had faces and it resembles to a little bit to the, to the actual training data. Now, the question that anyone would normally ask over here is that whether it is anything wrong with differential privacy. So um, don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with differential privacy. However, the problem consists into the level of granularity at which differential privacy was applied in such kind of scenario. So a differential privacy was applied, was actually protecting the records. The so we were not able to reconstruct specific records. If you ask me whether that's the question, uh, I can say no. However, we are targeting an entire class over here, so 
the model will learn features corresponding to the entire class, and in the end, the gun, it is querying about that class and improving uh, upon that class, so it will still be able to reconstruct a sample, a representative uh, from, from that class, always uh, as long as the model is, is learning. Uh, these are some further results. You can see over there also our uh, results on uh, CIFAR dataset, which as I mentioned is even more um, complex. We are targeting over there the, the horse class, and you can easily tell that that one is not, uh, is not a car or, or a ship. And these are other, res uh, other results on, on faces. So what's the takeaway over here at uh, the collaborative learning uh, for privacy, of course, at least at the current state of the art, um, is less desirable than the centralized one in the sense that, as I said, in the centralized one, you have only one uh, adversary, and that's the, the service provider, whereas in the collaborative learning, each and every one of us can potentially be an adversary. Okay? Uh, as for, uh, future work, essentially, we are intending to, to extend our range of experiments uh, on a broader range of data sets, even more complex ones, and we would like to further improve the, the gun architecture. And I have to point out over here that this is more art than science, because you need to do a lot of fine tuning, a lot of trial and error uh, in such kind of scenarios. However, uh, as I said, major developments are seen in, in this scenario. And of course, over here I introduced uh, our attack. However, countermeasures are uh, needed uh, collaborative deep learning uh, in, in such scenario was uh, designed as a way uh, to, to avoid uh, like heavy computational uh, primitives, like secure multi-party computation. However, uh, this brings the necessity to, to do further research in the field. And of course, if you guys are interested, you can find an open version of the paper uh, at, at the following link. And yep, that would be all. Thank you very much for your attention. May I? Uh, uh, Ilya Mironov, Google. Um, so uh, I think you said uh, in as many words, but I just wanted to confirm that uh, you would agree that the attack would not be applicable uh, if the privacy budget was set uh, on the basis of a person, not a record. True or false? Uh, so I said, I mentioned the level of granularity at which you apply the, the differential privacy. Yes, that's true. So the tax would not work if the well, privacy was managed on the level of a person. So over here, you can essentially set uh, like different, you know, um, granularity levels. But then we'd have to speak about uh, the the privacy and the utility trade-off. So if the model is not going to be able to learn anything, then of course our attack would not work. But you haven't done experiments that suggest that uh, uh, managing privacy on the level of a person is not effective. No, at the current state, no, we haven't. Yeah. Uh, so and uh, can I go to slide 25? Uh, so I want to compare this sentence with a sentence from the abstract of your paper, which states, I quote, a distributed federating, uh, federated or decentralized deep learning approach is fundamentally broken and does not protect uh, the training set of honest participants. Mm -hmm. Do you stand by the statement? Yes. Uh, it's fundamentally broken unless you uh, use differential privacy as intended. So if you, if you use differential privacy as it is right now, uh, we, we break it and we show the results. As However, it is, if you design a better ways of adopting differential privacy in such a scenario, uh, then you can potentially have countermeasures towards our attack. Uh, I checked the paper that you critique, Shokhan Shmatikov, and in that paper, they say that uh, the privacy budget is allocated on the basis of a person, not a record. Excuse me? In the paper by Shokri and Shmatikov, privacy budget is allocated per pe on, pe for, on the basis of a person, not a record. The privacy budget is large, and that's another problem with the paper, but they never say that the privacy budget is managed per, on a per record basis. Yeah, but over there, they apply the, the, the privacy on, on the shared parameters. So you can think of it that they are protecting actually the records that the person owes. Or the that's not owes. not that's not correct. That's uh, we can measure privacy of parameters. Uh, it's the F, It's the mechanism in the dif differential differential privacy. Or we can talk about the JSON databases, and this is the difference between the two da databases. 
and uh, and just uh, it's getting a bit technical. I uh, I refer people to a very nice blog post uh, put out by Frank McSherry. Have you had a chance to look at it? Yes. Yes. So uh, it advertised on his uh, on his Twitter. Again, his name is Frank McSherry. Uh, and uh, can I, if people look it up, like, do you have something uh, I can offer you? Uh, so uh, if I'm not wrong, that that post speaks about uh, the the model inversion effect, right? No. Um, no, the uh, the post speaks about your paper. Uh, it appeared uh, uh, like two days. It. it appeared two days ago. Oh, two days ago, maybe I missed it. Okay, yeah, it's a fresh post. I highly recommend it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.